Hey guys, it's Adam from Loose Pixel and welcome back. Now before I start with today's talk, which is a very important one, I'm very excited to share with you. Um, I first want to thank you for last week's talk. If you don't know what I'm talking about, read the comments section on my last week's talk and your faith in humanity will be instantly restored and re-restored tenfold because I've never in my life ever been exposed to that much positivity and affection and support and most importantly a sense of an incredibly high quality community that I'm so incredibly proud to be a part of. And in today's society, when there's so many difficult things going on very often with, you know, the virus spreading and dirty politics and environmental issues and local tragedies and whatnot, when you're stuck alone in, at home watching all this stuff, it can really dampen your spirits. And when you filter through even once positivity like you guys share with me on such a regular basis, when you filter through that and read that kind of stuff, even if it isn't directed at you personally, it reminds you that people are really awesome. So thank you. Now, that community I just spoke about plays a very big role in today's talk. And I have one of you guys to thank for today's talk because I got an email very recently um, from somebody who had asked me a question on to help support a debate he was having with one of his friends. And the big question, the, the overlying topic of this debate was, when it comes to building your skills, should you do so in private, like a sniper? Get that shot perfectly set, get all of your skills up to par, your portfolio, do all that training in quiet, and then launch yourself out and make that fatal shot to some studio or to some client? Or should you just put yourself out there even if you aren't that good yet? Or at least, you know, maybe you might not think you're that good, but maybe you actually do suck. Should you just get out there even if you're not that good? And I thought, what amazingly perfect timing for a question like that because I know so many people that could benefit from hearing about the subject more in depth. So consider this my longer winded, more in depth answer to his email, which of course I already replied to him, but I want to share that with you and elaborate on what I shared with him in the email. Here's the first thing. I'm in my forties now. I'm f almost 45 and, um, I have taught students ranging everywhere from around 16 years old, all the rated all the way to in seventies, well into their seventies and everything in between, of course. And it's remarkable how many students that I've taught and worked with who, despite being older, despite being closer to my age or even older than me, hadn't yet made that big step. They were still quote, preparing. They were still quote, planning. They were still quote, strategizing. And the reality is that day will never come. That perfect day will never come. Now, how do I know that? I know it because I've been working professionally for well over 20 years now. I've been a director, supervisor, I've worked for big studios, I've worked as an illustrator, I've worked as a senior concept artist, junior concept artist, I've I worked in a school, I've been running my own school for years now, and I still haven't reached it. And if I look back at my life, if I look back at those big steps that I took that were scary at the time, but not scary at all now looking back, they were, they were a piece of cake. But when I look back, there were very frightening steps for me to take. It, had I not taken those steps, had I not reached out and made myself more available to the public, had I not reached out to different communities, then I'm 100% sure I wouldn't be where I am today. Those opportunities that I, that I got in my life never would have happened. I never would have gotten these opportunities in the first place 
had I not put myself out there. And when I look back at some of the work and some of the opportunities that I got, when I look at the skill that I had as an artist back then, in my opinion, compared to what I do today, I sucked. I'm thinking, I thought, I would think to myself, who the hell would hire an artist that was that bad? I mean, I was bad. I might have been bad to a complete utter beginner, or I might be bad to somebody who's been working professionally for 20 years, but I wasn't bad in the general sense of the word. I was employable. I was good enough. And getting in the door was an opportunity for me to develop my skills to get better. And had I not made that step, had I not been brave and took the leap, that opportunity never would have happened. And it's amazing how many students of mine that are well into their life and they're working one or even two jobs on the side to try to make ends meet, which is perfectly fine because many people have to do that. Even lawyers sometimes have to work as a waiter because they can't find job in law. And when I look at these students who are still planning, you can tell that they're not planning. They're afraid. They're afraid to take that next step because you don't need to be a master of anything to, to start to see success. But it's fear. It's fear of judgment. It's fear of, of embarrassment. It's fear of, of humiliation. It's an ego thing, right? And I'm not saying ego is in the narcissistic. I'm saying ego in the, we all have egos. I have an ego. You have an ego. We all have an ego. We're all proud of ourselves. Otherwise we'd walk outside with without taking a bath we wouldn't change we'd wear the same dirty clothes every day right we have vanity we have an ego we do want people to think good of us so here's a little bit of advice to people who might be locking themselves up in their kitchen or their living room or their homemade studio and not getting out there and reaching out and taking that first big step. And I don't give a crap how old you are. I don't care if you're in your 20s. I don't care if you're in your 80s. If your goal is to become a professional, reach out. Reach out to a community. But don't reach out to any community because there's good communities and there's bad communities. There's communities that will help you grow and flourish and support you and give you confidence. There's other communities that are toxic and negative and gossipy and assholes. There's a lot of YouTuber artists out there. I find more often than not the younger ones that are real douchebags. They're popular douchebags, but they're douchebags. And you listen to the way they talk to people, the condescending, the gossip, the picking apart other people's skills and, and trying to embarrass them and trying to humiliate them and talking behind people's back. That shit's toxic. Avoid that. Stay away from people like that. Because who wants to open themselves up to somebody who's going to publicly humiliate you? That's like somebody pulling your pants down in front of everybody at school. That's, it's mortifying. So stay away from toxic assholes like that. Furthermore, not all artists are the same. Being, a, being an animation artist, being a dark fantasy artist, being a light fantasy artist, being somebody who's into anime and manga, being somebody who's into, into surrealism. These are all different communities that think and feel different things. And finding kindred spirits is hugely important to finding that sense of community because you're not just sharing technical skill as an artist. You're sharing passion. And that plays a very big part in the community. So reach out. But if you ever get negative feedback, if you ever get trolled, if you ever get overwhelmed with too much feedback where people are just, you know, you get 60 comments and everybody has a different opinion on what you should be doing with yourself, you might want to stay away from those because they'll do, they might do more harm than good. But don't give up on the community. You need the community. But just find a better one. Stay away from toxic people. I can't stress that enough. Now here's the second reason why you want to reach out. You're only one person. And what does that emotionally and physically mean for you? Well, it means you probably only have one drawing hand or maybe one drawing foot or maybe even only one drawing nostril depending on your situation, right? And when you reach out to a community, and this isn't only, this isn't only an art, this isn't life in general, you are not only multiplying your resources, multiplying your sight, multiplying your skill, 
but you're also creating connections with people that can also help you emotionally, help you spiritually, help you uh, overcome some of these mental obstacles. One of those mental obstacles might be your fear of reaching out in the first place, just like I'm doing with you right now. You need community. And I can't stress that enough for artists, particularly artists. I know I always I always try to put artists very often in their own little their own little unique category of human. Well, it's because there's a lot of truth to that if you think about it. I mean, one of the things I spoke about in last week's talk was how we are unique. We think in a very unique way. We have very unique preoccupations and 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 struggles and we need people who understand what those struggles are even if you have a loving supportive encouraging family that are a hundred percent behind what you do artistically that doesn't necessarily mean in fact that definitely doesn't mean that they get you on a more profound personal artistic level because well they're not artists they don't think the way you do they don't value the same things and they don't feel this that same visceral feeling that you might feel overcoming certain monumental obstacles as an artist and the, we have a lot of those we have to we have to overcome we have a lot of these obstacles we have to face and when you reach out to fellow artists they get you they are your kindred spirits they understand what you're going through so when an artist reaches out and praises you or compliments you or encourages you for something that you've accomplished or something you want to accomplish artistically that holds a lot more weight than just the common rabble that are saying great art wow you're so talented it holds more weight because they know what you need and they know what you have accomplished or want to accomplish and they can truly help you there and in today's society when there are so many things to be down about you need that tribe of yours to help pull you out of the dirt very often people get involved in different groups, different organizations, different sects, and sometimes in very unhealthy ways, cults, for one important reason. They're lonely. They need a sense of community. So reach out, but reach out to the right ones. They will multiply your eyes. They will multiply your minds, and they will expose you to the kind of stuff that you need to know. But most importantly, 99% of the time, unless you're specifically a member of the Montreal Surrealists who are 45 years old and are redhead males with freckles group, okay? Unless that's the group you're a member of and they only draw Surrealist kittens, then you are exposing yourself to a rather wide demographic of people from younger to older with varying styles and different angles. And you need a very broad perspective of the style of art that you're into to be truly successful at it, or at least to have insight into what's popular, into what's trending. For my particular style of art, more dark fantasy art, I am very heavily, closely connected to all of these different Dark Souls, Bekshinsky, Surrealism type of communities because, well, number one, seeing their art resonates with me. It's something that inspires me, something that doesn't discourage me. But it also is exposing me to what the world out there is into. And they share things with me and I share things back and I become part of this ecosystem of inspiration. So when I create something, there's a larger community of people that appreciate what I do because I am expressing something that matters to them as well, not only something that matters to me. Here's the third. Familiarity makes you more valuable. I, dr I truly understand why people might have voted for Trump back during the last election. I hope they don't make that same mistake again. But why did they vote for him? Why did they vote for him over people who might be more, quote, qualified? Now, again, I'm not making any personal judgments on your personal choices and your motivations. There are millions of them, and I'm sure you could bombard me with, with millions of reasons for it, many of which I'm not going to mention today. But his major asset was that he was a reality TV guy. He was familiar. 
And it's a natural human survival instinct to choose what's familiar, even if you know it's not the better choice. Because the human mind will think, well, I know he's not the best thing in the world, but at least I know I'm safe. So it's more of a survival decision rather than a preference decision in that sense. The other person sounds better, but I don't know them well enough, so I don't know if I can trust them yet. But this guy, he's been known in the media for the last 30, 40 years. There's millions of documentaries and shows with his face. We're familiar with his voice and I can tolerate the guy. So it's the best bet. And because he was inside everybody's home, people who like to watch his shows, because he is an entertainer after all, and we're, we're into his, his style, well, it made it an obvious choice for them. Now that relates directly to you. If there are two artists that are both equally qualified, but one person's been a member of a community, has made friends in the community, or just somebody who's very familiar, is a familiar face, their art style is very familiar, like with me and, and Tyler and Jessica when we do the, uh, the Brush Sauce Theater art contests, there are some artists, there's a few artists um, that consistently upload and and join in the, that competition every single time. They are consistently a part of this competition and they become very familiar names. Their art style, we start to get to know their art style more personally, start to be able to see their progression, see positive or negative patterns in their artwork, and we become more helpful to them as people who are critiquing or commenting on their artwork. But more importantly, they become a household name. They become familiar to us and to all of you guys that are watching as well. And that matters because the artistic community is a very tight-knit group of people. Even though the world is a big, big world out there, we all, we all are part of the same channels. We all follow the same content. And we all eventually end up hearing the same names and if that name pops up 10 times in a row we start to remember it and if that name is brought up on a list next to somebody else of equal skill or even maybe slightly better there's a very good chance that that person who's already familiar to the community is going to get that opportunity first because well they've earned it they're they've become a part of the team they've become a part of the quote tribe and they're more likely to be recognized and treated as such and lastly here is the most important point of all and that is socializing is a skill that needs to be trained what do i mean by this well there's a lot more to being a professional than just being able to draw well in fact you can draw extremely well but you still can't succeed professionally and the reason being is sharing work is something you have to train doing. And a perfect analogy for this is when I first started to teach myself Spanish. I went balls to the wall, knee deep in learning Spanish. I borrowed a, uh, a book from a friend of mine and I would take it and I would go to a cafe or a restaurant and I would spend hours ordering cheap coffees and loitering as much as humanly possible. And I would sit there, sit there with my book and my pad and I would go through the vocabulary, 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 verbs, 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 verbs. And I would just learn words, 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 and sentences and sentences. And then I'd quiz myself. I was really heavy into it. I really, I was really determined to learn. And I was excited because I was starting to be able to put phrases together and I was starting to be able to get creative with it. And I was starting to be able to, to, understand things and I could listen to to podcasts and I could listen to shows in Spanish and I was like shit I'm, I'm, I'm I can understand what's going on here and it really felt I really started to feel connected to this community because I was I was understanding the language and language is huge when it comes to connecting to different communities a lot of my incentive for doing that was the fact that I was very much into the salsa dance community as well I was always surrounded by by Spanish-speaking people from every different country. And one day I went to a shoe store or something like that. And there was a woman who was there who was really sweet and very sociable. And she was, she was Mexican and she was talking to one of her friends in Spanish and everything like that. And uh, I decided to challenge myself because I was waiting for her to help me with something. And um, she came up to me, she says, hi, with a big smile on her face. I said, hi. 
And I said, do me a favor. I said, just speak to me in Spanish because I got to practice my Spanish. She says, no problem. And she starts talking to me in Spanish. And I understood her. And I opened up my mouth to reply. And I felt like a vice grip was tightened around my throat. And I'm sure to any of you listeners, because a lot of you listeners, my students are international, that most of my students don't speak English. And uh, not at least as their, as their, their first language. And I opened my mouth to talk and my throat tightened up like a vice grip. The words would not come out. They refused to come out. And she laughed about it. She didn't think it. She honestly didn't care anything about it. She was very sweet about it. She goes, she goes, uh, don't be shy. Come on, talk, talk. You know, she gave me a smack on the smack on the shoulder and she told me to talk. And I tried and I was, I, I sounded like a complete idiot. Or at least I felt like I sounded like a complete idiot because I couldn't get even the basic words out. The, the sentences were there, the phrases, the vocabulary, it was all there. But my mouth didn't work. And walked away realizing something. Speaking a language is not just an intellectual thing. It's a physical thing. Speaking is physical. You have to, tr you have to bridge a connection between your brain and your mouth. And it was a very profound experience because I grew up being bilingual. I grew up being speaking English and French. And I was, I learned those when I was a little kid. I, I grew up in Quebec, so it's prerequisite. We all went to English and French school. We all learned to speak both languages. So I never experienced language fear, language shyness. The same thing applies to art. You have to train yourself to share yourself with the public. And I remember once years ago, a fellow YouTuber who's a little bit more beginner, he's, he's not as advanced artistically. Um, in fact, very beginner, I would argue very, very beginner artistically. And that's not an insult on his skill. In fact, it's a compliment reached out to me. I didn't know this guy. And he reached out to me and asked me if, if I would mind doing an interview on his YouTube channel. And it's there right now. I won't say who, I'm sure if you do a little digging, you'll find it. And he, he asked me if I wanted to do an interview on his channel. And I said, sure, absolutely. And he interviewed me and he, he asked me a bunch of really good questions and stuff like that. Meanwhile, he had a drawing, you know, like Anthony Jones would do or whatever, there would be a painting going on, his painting. And, and he asked me all these, these questions about succeeding artistically and about how to become a YouTuber, or how to, how to make a name for yourself online. And, um, one of the questions he asked was, uh, what advice would you give to people who are trying to start a YouTube channel or trying to make a name for themselves online? And I said, content comes before popularity. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, a lot of people will post three or four videos and then get discouraged because nobody is subscribing or nobody is following or liking their videos. And I said, the reason being is if you put yourself in the perspective of a viewer, when you subscribe to somebody, it's because you're subscribing to a new library of content that you can enjoy. And if there's no library of content to enjoy, well, then you're subscribing to two or three videos and there's not a lot of value in that for people. So before people will start to feel, people need to feel safe before subscribing to you because they need to feel like they're not just adding some dead channel onto their subscriber list, that there's actually content that they'll be able to enjoy on a consistent basis. So I said that content has to exist first. But the first 20, 30, 40, 50 videos that you post might get little to no traction because it's you don't have enough of a library to attract attention. It needs to be there first. And once people look at it, they find you and they go, oh, that's kind of interesting. And they look and they go, oh shit, this guy's got another 50 videos out there. Oh, well, subscribe because I can enjoy a lot of this and I can just go on his playlist and I can just go on autoplay and just listen to him all day. And that has to be there first. My God, on my channel, I must've had about 40, 50 videos before every, anybody really started to notice that I existed. I, I probably had a couple of maybe, maybe at most a couple hundred subs. That's about it. And that to me was a big deal back in the time, but it was very, very, very slow growth and slow progress. But then all of a sudden, once I hit this kind of milestone, it started to pick up quite substantially, I really noticed a difference. Maybe it had something to do with the algorithm. And that was the advice that I gave him on that channel. Again, you can go in, I'm sure you just look up Adam Duff interview or something like that. And it's funny, I remember one of the first comments on his channel was, who's Adam? <laughs> I was like, nice, nice. I feel very loved, you know? But um, one of the things that, that 
The, what really struck me about this guy, and one of the things I really respected about this guy was the fact that despite being a very beginner artist, that didn't stop him from producing regular content and drawings online. It didn't stop him. He had this fearless attitude about him that you can only respect. And I thought to myself, due to his bravery, due to him reaching out, from a spectator's perspective, if opportunities arose, I would want him to get an opportunity based off of his effort and his courage alone. He's earned a certain rite of passage from a social aspect, but that doesn't stop him. And I thought he's a uniquely brave guy because a lot of people wouldn't have that kind of courage until they're already felt they were good enough. And a lot of people, as we've discussed today, never feel good enough. But he's an example to all of us that even at the bare bones beginner level of an artist, when you have the bravery to put yourself out there, you earn nothing but respect from your community. And with that said, I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care.